Good evening from New York. I am Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Journeys. The gentleman next to me is Mr. Uh, Atuan Craigwell. Atuan, good evening and welcome to CWS. Thank you very much and good evening, uh, um, um, Selwyn. Thank you. Atuan contributed as a writer for Out in Jersey magazine, the Bilerico, am I correct? Bilerico project. Bilerico project for several publications, including Fortune, Small Business Magazine, The Bronx Times Reporter, The New York Amsterdam News, was the system editor with the Network Journal, and a contributor to MainStreet.com. I thought, which of these give you the most satisfaction as a journalist or as a writer? Hmm. What's missing from that list mm -hmm. is uh, my work in Connecticut with the Villager newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, so it was both the Villager and the Bronx Times that I got the most enjoyment out of because um, as I always said, as I always said, is that as a journalist, every new story that you do is a whole new experience. And you have to learn about that particular subject that you're covering or reporting on um, so that you can transform, transmit it, and communicate it to your readers. And you have to simplify it. Um, and for me, that was, that was a challenge. And that was also the excitement. Because um, somebody accused me of being a control freak is that that allowed me to be in control of the interview of the subjects and everything like that and the story and narrative that I was going to tell. Um, yes, so the village newspapers in Connecticut um, where I covered uh, for two towns, Killingly and Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and for the Bronx Times where I was responsible for um, Central and South Bronx. Um, yeah. Talking about what people say, what is usually accurate when those close to you describe you? Well, some of the comments I've been hearing recently from people who I've not seen in, in several years and over 20 years is that I haven't changed. Um, in terms of my speech and cadence, but also in my expression, in my thought process and how, how I one, two, two people who are close to my, close to me, one is a cousin and another one is a close family friend. Um, several years ago, they said to me, these are two women and I, they don't know each other, I don't think. Um, and they both said to me that since I was a child, I'm always somebody who spoke exactly what I, what was on my mind. Um, that sometimes it may seem as though I have no filter. And I, I just talk my mind. I just say what exactly how I feel and what I think. Um, and I, I damn the consequences, which of course, I always often got into trouble. And I still do get into trouble for saying the things, you know. <laughs> well, 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 you know, you, <laughs> you grew up in Guyana. Yes. Um, we both know, I'm Guyanese myself, so we both know what it's like um, having that kind of a of an attitude where you just speak your mind and damn the consequence. How did that resonate with your parents, Antoine? And, and I mean, I'm going to talk about, ask you to talk a little bit more about them later on, but how did that demeanor, attitude resonate with them when you were growing up? Well, I would say, and I think a lot of Guyanese can identify with it, and perhaps not just Guyanese, but a lot of uh, West Indian or African um, diasporic peoples can identify with it is that I had a way that I would just simply blurt out whatever I felt and whatever I thought um, regardless of where I was and um, I can remember there were times when um, my mother might have been with her friends and she might have taken me and I was there with them and somebody might have said something and I would have jumped in and made a comment and I just got a I just got a, a glance from my mother um, <laughs> The speed at which I would shut up because I know that when I got home, you know, I was going, I was going to get licks. Um, and being that I was very much light, I was really lighter than I am, am now mm -hmm. as a child. So when I got licks, it showed, okay, because the marks would show on my arms, on my back, 
Um, and if I got a slap, you will see the person's handprint on my face clearly. Um, so, this, did, did that mean less licks or, or oh, more? Hell, oh, hell no, more. Oh, God, no. Tell us about this New Amsterdam boy and why he roamed the grounds of the Barbies Asylum. Well, there are a lot of people from New Amsterdam and maybe from Georgetown who might remember Nurse Craig well. Um, that was my adopted mother, Nurse Craig well, who lived in Savannah Park. And she had a job as a nurse at, um, at the asylum, at the mental hospital. Um, she was very well known and everybody knew her. Um, always riding her bicycle um, from Savannah Park to, to New Amsterdam, to the mental hospital. Um, and there were times when maybe she might not have had anybody to, take, to look at me, you know, take care of me at home. Or she may just decide where she want to take me to work. And so she will take me to if she's working day shift. Certainly not night shift, mm -hmm. but during the daytime she would take me. And if it's like holidays or you know, you know, this like 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 um, school holidays or you know, like this, you know, um, like August holidays and that kind of stuff, she would take me with her to to work. And while she's in in the ward, I have to run the um, the grounds. Um, she, you know, there were friends of hers who worked in the kitchen. Um, many people in New Amsterdam might remember the story way back um, several several years ago when a pressure cooker, an industrial sized pressure cooker exploded in New Amsterdam mental hospital, ripped through the roof, the, the cover ripped through the roof and came down and killed maybe one or two people mm. in the kitchen. Um, but not to say that, that I was in any danger. Um, I think the, even the people at the security gate to the hospital, at the, at the asylum, knew that I was Nurse Craig Wilson. And so they, nobody minded, and I would roam and run all over and go wherever I wanted and see whatever I could. Um, and when I was hungry, I'd just go to the kitchen. And those ladies, they knew me, and I'd get something to eat, and I'd be all right. How do you think, uh, and I, I, I interpret this as freedom, absolutely. Freedom. Oh, it was an incredible amount of freedom. How would you say, in retrospect, that level of freedom at that age, that, that was about what, nine, ten? Oh, no, 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 I was about five, six. Five, six. Yeah, yeah, five, six, seven, yeah. How would you say that level of freedom helped to mold, shape this man we have come to know, know as Well, it's not, well. well, it's the, but it's the, it's the ability to roam. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to wander. It's the ability to discover, to ask questions. Um, and I give you an example. And I was, I was talking about this uh, two Fridays ago at um, the Public Library for Women's of Mission International um, conference. And again, when I spoke at a, conf at a presentation in Linden for some women in Linden, you know, the following Monday, is that I think when I go back to look at it, is that my um, interest in mental health goes back to the days when I remember when I was roaming and running around in Barbies, in the madhouse, in the asylum. And I remember distinctly there were several occasions when I saw there were two wooded, wooden penned off areas out in the open. Um, they were extensions of like the building, but it was just like a concrete apron that was fenced off with wood. Um, and I remember several times I would go and peep through the wood to see what was behind there. Um, childish curiosity, of course, but then on both occasions I would see men in separate areas and women in separate areas and they'd be walking around in this penned off area naked. And it wasn't so much about a child being exposed to or seeing adult genitalia or anything like that. What I was concerned about and what intrigued me the most is why were these people walking around in this area without clothes exposed to the elements well of course if it rained they would go back inside but in the sun if it's got too hot they would also go back inside into the shade but i wondered what was going on in their minds what caused them to be walking and what what happened to them and as a child growing up, it's not the kind of question you're going to ask. I wouldn't go and ask 
you know, Aunt Lerner, those who know her, I wasn't going to ask Aunt Lerner, what was wrong with those people? Because I know that she would probably say, not to worry with it, just, just, you know, it's none of your business. Just, you know, just don't worry. Or she might have said, well, there, there's something wrong, but I can't, you might not understand, I can't tell you. Um, but so it's like, that was the beginning of my curiosity in terms of mental health. But the Nancy, coming back to answer your question, running around, it wasn't just running around in the mental hospital. It was running around Savannah Park. Mm -hmm. It was running around in the ball field before, before multilateral was built. Mm -hmm. It was going down the back dam and picking monkey apple and, and you know, catching Saki Winky and, 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 um, and, you know, and, and parrots. It was, it was going under the, um, the bridge that leads to um, the, you know, the ball field and rolling up fiber in brown paper and smoking at a cigarette. You know, like the, con the coconut fiber from the bed. So it was, it was all these things and running all over the place and just having fun. Did you have a lot of friends? Oh yes, mm -hmm. oh yes. Um, I went to teach a mentor in New Amsterdam in, in Savannah Park for kindergarten. And every afternoon at three o'clock, she would bring us out. Um, she would walk everybody home. And on the way out, we would come across this lady who used to sell Solara mm -hmm. in front of Gaty Cinema in New Amsterdam. And she would always, she, she'd be going out to sell so that the Solara would be nice and warm and pine tart and cheese roll. And the ends, the Solara ends is what we, everybody used to want the Solara ends. So it was a crowd around her clamoring to get a piece of Solara. We call it roly-poly in those days. But I had a lot of friends in, in teaching mentor and then I went to St. Aloysius Boys School um, in St. John Street. And I went to um, lessons right opposite um, right opposite St. Aloysius, and then um, Aunt Lerner trans had me transfer to Scarda Boys School, um, to, um, to Scarda School at the corner of Trinity and Main Street, right opposite Trinity, Trinity Anglican Church, and obliquely across from the Chinese restaurant. So anybody from those days back in New Amsterdam would remember the Chinese restaurant on the upstairs that used to make a wicked, a really nice mixed lao mein and a mixed fried rice that Aunt Lorna would buy for us on a Sunday afternoon when we coming back from All, All, Souls Ch um, All Saints Church or there by Princess Elizabeth Road. Um, but I had a lot of friends. Um, one of my best friends at the time was a young guy and I only just reconnected with him. He's in Canada. A guy named Rohan Amrao. Mm -hmm. His father and his, his family owned a gas station um, there on Water Street. Um, we were such good friends that every day we would fight. Mm. We would fight every morning, but by lunchtime, he either comes to where I went for lunch or I would go home to his house for lunch. Mm. And we'd go back to school in the afternoon, and for some reason that we'd get into a fight and then we'd gone again in the afternoon. Um, North Sprigwell. Yes. I, I, I noticed your chain between North Korea and Aunt Lauren. Same, same person. Same person. Um, so, your parents, how, where were they at this time? I mean, how did you end up living with North Korea or Aunt Lauren? <sighs> but let me ask you a different way. At what point did North Korea step into your life for more, as far as you can remember? I don't think I can remember when she stepped into my life. Wow. Um, because I was uh, adopted at the age of three months. Mm -hmm. um, the circumstances of which I would rather keep within the families that are concerned. My adopted family, which is the Craigwell family, uh -huh. and my biological family. Right. Um, but it has come so come to be that in the last, in many, as the years roll on, that I become more and more aware of my biological family. Um, but my, in terms of the construct mm -hmm. of parenting, the construct of motherhood, mm -hmm. Aunt Lerna, Nurse Craig Well, is my mother. Yes. Um, because she brought me up, she looked after me, she was there for me all through my life. Um, and when she died in 20, 2006, 
that was one of the most difficult experiences that I had um, to reconcile that I will no longer see her because what was interesting about our relationship is that I was for many years up to about 25, 26, her son. Mm -hmm. But as I got older, I became not just a son, but I would say a little more than a friend. Mm. Um, where I could perceptively identify the moments when our relationship changed. When she started to recognize me and accept me as an adult, no longer as a child. Mm. And the reason I say that is because my conversations with her were adult conversations. She was telling me and talking to me and confiding in me in ways that I would not, I could not have imagined her doing that when I was a child. And, and I understand that the reason she did that is because, and I'll, this is, and this is, this is an example of, that's a double-edged sword in a sense, that as I grew up, at varying moments in my life, she would tell me, you don't belong to us, you know, you are adopted. Hmm. And at varying stages in my life, in, as I, in, as, uh, 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 you know, as I grew, she would remind me of this, but not in a malicious way, not in a way that says that I don't actually belong. And psychologically, that might have some, some as there may be some remnant or some effect of that. But as I grew older, there was more sense of belonging, that I am now continually part of the family. I am, and I'm always introduced as her, her son. I'm always introduced as a member of the family. I'm always referred to as her son. And some older people from New Amsterdam may not remember or they may not have known that I was the last son, um, that I am the last son. But as, she, as we both grew older, even up to before she died, um, the relationship that we had was one where she knew that she can discuss certain things with me. It would remain in confidence and we would have adult conversations. Um, and, and, and to some degree, she was able to unburden and open up and talk about things that I never knew. Um, some, some also of my own history that I never knew. Why do you think she was so candid with you about One of the things I, re I can remember her saying to me was that she never intends it for it to be, as I said, malicious, mm -hmm. but she intended that I should know where I come from, who I belong to, who I don't belong to, where, where is my place. And I think the better part of that question that you're asking is that as I grew older, she watched my level of maturity. She watched me be, res she watched how responsible, she, she, she monitored me without actually saying that I'm watching you, I'm looking at you. And so she was able to gauge from the conversation that we were having, from the things that she saw me doing, from the things that she was hearing about me from other people, that she could now feel comfortable that I'm no longer a child I'm now an adult, and I'll jump up, and I'll jump way ahead now by suggesting that that's somewhat of my mentality today. That I don't tell people how old I am, mm -hmm. but I, those who know, will know what I'm saying is that because of how old I am today, mm -hmm. that I am not putting up with any nonsense from anybody. Amen. Okay. You know, I, as you jump forward, let me jump with you, then we'll come back. Mm -hmm. And to, to ask you this, um, you must know where you came from. Yes. You must know who you belong to. How do you see those principles 
or tenants working its way in when you are actually counseling people today, young men, whatever. How important is that? That's a multifaceted type of question. And I will suggest that what has helped me mm -hmm. to come to terms and understand who I am is bringing the totality of my experiences to bear in any one given moment. And when I talk to people about understanding themselves, I ask them to bring all of themselves. And one of the things that I do when I do presentations and I do talks is I say to people this, when was the last time you stood butt ass naked in front of a full length mirror and looked at yourself and what you see looking back at you is all of the people in your life who has expressed some form of opinion or perception about who you are and what you see looking back at you in that mirror is everybody's perception and acceptance or rejection of you. And it's up to you at that moment, standing in front of that mirror, to decide if you will accept yourself for who you are or you will reject yourself. And that sense of self-acceptance Helps, to, uh, helps you to become grounded in who you are. That and if you can accept yourself for who you are, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity or anything, if you can accept yourself for who you are, then to fuck with everybody else. Mm -hmm. Because nothing else will matter because right there at that moment, you are comfortable in knowing who you are. You've accepted who you are and nothing else matters. Um. We have a mixed audience in terms of oh, yes. autism, so. But I'm interested in the metaphor you use. I, I, I said I was going to arc back just now, but <laughs> I'm to follow you. And the metaphor of nakedness. Is it in bearing the naked truth? Is it in the naked truth or bearing your soul? Why? Both. Both. Okay. Both. And the reason I say nakedness, mm -hmm. being butt ass naked in front of the mirror, is that you are seeing yourself without any adornments. You're seeing yourself completely open and vulnerable. Yes. You're seeing yourself warts, stretch marks, boils, scars, imperfections, bits of flesh hanging here, whatever, discolorations. Because what you see is also how you compare yourself to others and how you then match your own self as you compare and when you look at yourself if you don't accept yourself then it means you're living somebody else's life you're living another comparison i want to go back to aunt laura uh -huh. and how open she was with you at a certain point you said uh -huh. you recognized the transition um were was it two way were you allowed to be equally open yes before? yes uh -huh. And, and do you remember um, the a defining moment in that? There were several. So, mm -hmm. okay. There were several defining moments. Mm -hmm. um, there was one moment I remember. Um, I was already living here. I was in New York. She was in Maryland, and I called her up one day and I said, "I have something to tell you, but I'm not going to tell you over the phone." So I went down to Maryland and got there about midnight. By then I could have drive. And I went down to Maryland, got up next morning, um, and she was sitting at the, at the kitchen table. Um, my mother always had a habit, and she knows that I never like eating by myself. So she would always come and sit with me but I don't talk while I eat either. So we will sit in silence. This is since back in Guyana. We would sit, she would sit with me in silence until I finished eating and then she'd get up and leave. But 
I don't like eating by myself. Um, and I had breakfast and so forth, and I said, you know, I told you I want to tell you something. And she said, what is it? And I said, well, I know, and I said to her, I said, I know in Guyanese culture, it is worse if you hear it from somebody else than if you hear it from the person themselves. It has, uh, it has a, a, a much more damaging effect if you hear something from somebody. And I said to her, I said, and I want to tell you about me so that you have an opportunity to be part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is who, and I told her who I am. And I said, I want you to hear from me so that if something were to happen to me and I'm lying in a hospital bed, you don't hear from somebody else. You're hearing it directly from me. And I told her what, who I had become up to that point in my life. And she was like, well, I may not agree with it, but there's nothing I can say. And she got very quiet and she got up and she went into the bedroom. When it was time for me to leave, she came and she bid me goodbye. She didn't say anything. About two weeks later, she wrote me a letter. And she said, regardless of who you are, you are still my son. And I love you for who you are. Now, as I've continued to do the work that I do, one of the things that I've consistently heard from many men is their mother's acceptance of them for who they are. The absence of which causes them tremendous psychic pain and cause them to descend into depression and consider suicide because their mothers did not accept them. When my mother said to me that I accept you for who you are, you're still my son and I love you, to me, that was, she just gave me a license. She just gave me a license and I was like, to hell with everybody else. My mother accepts me, my mother's got my back. I don't care about anybody else. And in fact, as I subsequently learned is that research tells us that if there's a young man, a child, especially a male child, who is accepted by his, his parents for who he is, then that child grows up to be a well-adjusted member of, fam of the family, of society, and of the community. But the minute he hears or gets a sense that his parents do not accept him for who he is, then he was then create alternate means to be able to mask or hide his behavior, who he is. And at some point in time, those two identities or personalities are going to collide. And the question is, what happens at that point of crisis? I want to ask you this and take a quick break. But I'm, ask, I'm asking this question for young men who might have might be on that same particular path you've been on and still battling especially in the caribbean a place like guyana um still battling with the fear of coming out or being accepted and so on where along the line in in, in your uh, in your life did you realize that a, you were different, and at some point you have to have this conversation with your mother. How how soon, how early did you realize that they were, that you were, I'm not sure what is the right terminology here, but you were different to, to other boys, or you were leaning, you know, this is, uh, this is part of you. At what time did that happen? Um, I think I knew very early that I was different, but I think I was socialized into thinking or into accepting that I could not have been different. So in kindergarten, every morning I used to be in a fight. A fight? Every day in primary school, in primary school I was in a fight. In secondary school, I used to, I was all, I used, to, I used to be the instigator, I used to fight, 
And when we talk about bullying, I knew about bullying. Okay? Um, but I knew that I was not like everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and when I knew that was when I learned to cook. Um, I have a picture that my sister took of me when I broke, when I was making, frying my first egg. Um, when we lived in South Rheinveld. And I learned how to cook. I learned how to clean, how to polish, change curtains. My great aunt, who's lived at number five village in the West, West, West Coast Barbies, mm -hmm. she would come to visit, which is my mother's aunt, my mother's aunt. And she taught me to crochet. She taught me to knit. And I looked at my mother when she got some spare time, she used to do hock back um, placemats and so forth. Um, and I learned how to do that. I learned how to iron. I learned how to starch. When I was in national service, I learned how to, how to, um, make starch from cassava and starch my clothes, starch my uniform. Um, I learned how to make coconut oil. I learned, you know, so, and a lot of the guys, of my age group weren't doing these kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that I lived in South Rheinveld and the next door neighbor, they had an open stretch and almost every afternoon after school or work, they'd be playing cricket. Um, and on Sundays and Saturdays, they'd be playing cricket and a, and a serious cricket game too. But I was always inside. I couldn't, I was not really allowed to go outside. Mm -hmm. um, and when I went outside, I couldn't wear, I couldn't go walking barefoot. I always had a pair of slippers on. Um, and one of the things I also noticed is that when, when I was outside with my friends or anywhere hanging out, the type of vernacular I would use, the Guyanese Creole, I couldn't use that inside. So I had to speak a different, I had to speak proper English inside, not I, can't, I couldn't bring the Creole inside. Um, when I asked, and I heard a word or I saw a word, I would say, well, what does that word mean? I was, I was directed straight, because the house had a library, I was directed to the library. Um, so I would say that I had maybe five, five main books, the Bible, the dictionary, Roger's, Ro, Ro, and Roger's thesaurus are three of those. Those were my best friends, um, and the World Atlas. Wow. Let's take a quick 